do I think we're in a crypto winner? No, I don't think we're in a crypto winner. I think we're fighting through uh, we're fighting through a lot of macro issues, right? Like the people are uncertain about uh, the degree and extent of regulatory intervention and what will happen. They're uncertain about geopolitics, you know, be it either, you know, Russia, China policy on crypto versus, you know, Ukraine and the like. They're uncertain about uh, about monetary policy. Like they're like, oh, there's no inflation. So Bitcoin trades down. Oh my, there's massive inflation and the Fed's going to raise <laughs> so interest. Crazy. So yeah. Bitcoin trades down. Bitcoin prices have tumbled once again as the crypto markets struggle in another big crash. The ongoing tensions between Russia and Ukraine have resulted in a drop in cryptocurrency prices as global equity markets also tumble. The prospect of geopolitical escalation has been the main driver of price moves in the broader risk asset spectrum for the past couple of weeks. And now investors are rushing to take risk off the table, and stock markets globally are seeing major declines. Recently, MicroStrategy CEO and Bitcoin guru Michael Saylor spoke about current Bitcoin market, crypto winter, and the possibility of Bitcoin flippening. He also discusses MicroStrategy's macro strategy and, of course, Michael Saylor's favorite altcoin. Hello and welcome to Money Talks. In today's video, Michael Saylor gives an update on Bitcoin volatility as well as institutional adoption. At the end of this video, Saylor shares his views regarding altcoins and whether they would ever flip Bitcoin's market cap. If you like the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and turn on the post notifications. The second thing is is all of these public companies, like public Bitcoin miners, um, as they come public and they raise capital, they're stabilizing uh, the entire asset class. I don't know if you noticed, but Marathon, um, Marathon did a big convert offering, $650 million yeah. a few months ago. And then uh, just yesterday, I think they announced a $750 million ATM equity shelf registration. Other miners, you know, Hut 8 have announced another shelf registration. Um, Riot did a $600 million equity raise. There'll be 24 companies that came, that will be public by the end of the quarter. Terra Wolf came public. Core Scientific came public with a multi hundred million dollar equity raise. Anytime a Bitcoin miner raises money, there's only one thing that's happening there, which is that means that that money is being spent either on mining equipment or it's being spent on Bitcoin. But ultimately, it, it, it's really being spent on Bitcoin because if they have the capital, that's that much less Bitcoin they're selling. And so these, this whole crypto winner idea was boom and bust cycles and living through the four-year halvings. But what happens is once half of the hash power of the network is public, I don't know if you noticed the Bitcoin mining council is like 46% of the hash power of the network now. And most of them are, you know, not all of them, but a lot of them are public. As those companies come public and they buy up the private miners and they issue equity and they issue debt, then the amount of Bitcoin they sell decreases and the stock to flow increases and the stock to flow eventually goes to infinity. And that means the available supply, you know, each, each uh, day goes to a trickle and that creates price pressure. So those dynamics that, uh, are going to decrease volatility. If banks are able to hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet, like the big banks, they get comfortable. And FDIC guidance would be a critical catalyst there. Then you're going to see uh, a big demand. And then if you see companies like Silvergate Bank issued credit lines, Mm -hmm. If you have FDIC insured banks, they get a green light to do stable coins, a green light to get into crypto lending. Then people that own Bitcoin don't have to sell the Bitcoin. If they don't sell the Bitcoin, instead of holding it for four years, they hold it for eight years. If they hold it for eight years, it's the same as the stock to flow doubling. Michael Saylor also addresses the issue of Bitcoin volatility. According to Saylor, Bitcoin volatility is decreasing over time as the asset class is maturing. Also, more institutional investors are coming into the Bitcoin space, and that is driving the demand and decreasing the volatility in a consistent manner. 
I think the first decade you saw these drawdowns of 80, 85 percent. And I think in the last two years, we've seen drawdowns are like maxed out at 50 percent or so. Might have been a 55 or 53 percent or something. But the volatility is less. I think that the asset class is maturing. I guess, you know, there are a lot of reasons why the asset class is volatile. Uh, the lack of wash trading rules, the, the extreme leverage, the cross collateralization, the security tokens, the 24 7, 365, the uncertainty, the accounting treatment, right? I could give you a litany of why it's volatile. Mm -hmm. Uh, I could tell you why it's getting less volatile, and that's as, as more institutional investors come in, and as their time horizon gets longer, it'll get less volatile, and it will get less volatile as more regulation comes. For, uh, and ironically, a lot of things that people think are bad or will actually be good for the asset class. Like if, uh, if the house decides that they're going to implement the wash trading rule, and that means you're not allowed to sell something and buy it back the next hour, if that happens, a lot of fast money trading will uh, will be discouraged. Right? That would be now, good. That would be good for the space, I believe. That would decrease the volatility. No. Yeah, because like right now, if if Apple stock traded down ten percent, you don't sell a hundred billion of it and buy it back in anticipation of tax harvesting, mm. because you know you have to wait thirty days before you can buy it back. So Apple stock is less volatile because of that rule. But the cryptos don't have that rule. So it's like the tax law encourages you to sell whenever you have a loss. Yeah. Right. And that and that's kind of like, uh, you know, that's a, a green light for fast money traders to come. And they're like, since since they should sell and they know you should sell, then they're going to make you sell so they can buy back cheaper. And so you've got some built in structural incentives for it to be volatile. Is Bitcoin ever going to be replaced by any altcoin? Bitcoin flippening is a major issue that is being discussed among crypto holders, so Saylor shares his perspective on the issue. He thinks no other crypto can replace Bitcoin because of the different use cases that they offer. Michael Saylor also discusses why Bitcoin is a universally acknowledged digital property. Saylor thinks that the use case of a digital property is a $100 trillion market and admits that Bitcoin is completely perfect the way it is, and it is here to stay for a long time. Yeah, I think Bitcoin's crossed the event horizon. That is, it, it is universally acknowledged digital property, and the, the use case for digital property is certainly a $100 trillion type market. And if you want digital property, you want something with a protocol that is so so stable that a hundred years from now, you don't expect any change. Even a thousand years from now, you don't expect to change. I surveyed my Twitter followers and on average, they think Bitcoin will be around for 3,800 years. Okay, so you want, <laughs> you want something which is a firm foundation that is not changing. And, uh, and Bitcoin is really perfect for what it is. I think with regard to market cap numbers, the issue with market caps is, is if I have a very thin float, if only 1% of the tokens trade, then I can calculate a market cap, but that's not the same as the effective liquidity. Um, you, what you really have to do is look at liquidity. And uh, I, ultimately, I don't really think it makes sense to compare market caps to come to the conclusion and even on a liquidity level, I don't think it matters that much. Like, for example, um, let's take Tether or uh, a stable coin. They trade massive amount every day. If you go and you look, like for sure, yeah, $40 absolutely. billion dollars a day. Okay, does that mean that Tether is going to replace Bitcoin? No. No. I, I, I think that the best way to think about this is there are different use cases. Do you have a digital exchange? Do you have digital art? Do you have a digital currency? Do you have a digital property? Bitcoin is digital property. It's not digital art. It's not a digital currency. A currency needs to be a medium of exchange you can transmit without a tax obligation in a compliant fashion. Otherwise, it's not a currency, right? So, so a stable coin can be a currency, you know, if the regulators tolerate it. That's a currency. All, there's a, all these things have their own different market and they, they have their own regulatory dynamics and their own competitive dynamics. And if you segment the market that way, 
you know, Bitcoin's really competing against like kind proof of work networks that aspire to be digital property. Uh, you know, and you could probably say it's like the forks and you saw what happened with Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin Satoshi Vision. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, they will be whatever they will be. Uh, and I think that um, if what you want is something that'll last hundreds of years, that's not going to change, then you, you want a Bitcoin because you value it. And that brings us to the end of today's video. Do you think Bitcoin will reach new highs this year or drop below the $20,000 mark? Tell us in the comments. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. We'll see you soon with the next video. Thank you so much for watching.